My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCahn.com. Hello, my name is Michelle Taylor. I'm the CEO of IQ Management Corporation and the executive producer of Digital Girl Productions. I'm joined today with Lisa Bisturek, who is an instructor at SAIT focused on energy asset management. Hi, Lisa. Hi, thank you for having me. I'd also like to welcome Jeffrey Kahn to the show, best-selling leading author and advisor here based out of Calgary. The book is called Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas. The event that we're hosting on September the 9th is titled The Same, and the co-author of the book is Rachel Gordon. Please welcome Jeffrey to the show. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here. As a best-selling author and advisor in digital transformation and innovation in oil and gas, why don't you give us a little bit of background on the book itself? There's been a lot of notoriety. You've attended a number of events here in uh, the Calgary and Alberta area and even further afield. So people have been seeing you out in the market at the different conferences and trade shows and a, a whole ton of notoriety online. You've got such a huge following. So the, the story of the book began in 2012, 2013. I had relocated to Australia to work on the liquefied natural gas industry. And I was struck at the time by the pace by which Australians were embracing digital tools, not just in the oil and gas industry, but across great cuts of their economy, uh, financial services, healthcare, agriculture. And when I returned to Calgary in 2016, um, I brought the uh, ideas that I had been nurturing in Australia with me and began to work at the intersection of the digital industry with the oil and gas industry. And uh, starting in, in um, uh, uh, late 2016, I began to write a series of articles that, that probed it deeply into the different aspects of digital innovation in oil and gas. And after a couple of years, I published um, a book uh, in, in January of this year, actually, 2019, called Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil and Gas. The book uh, digs into these uh, uh, and tries to answer several questions that I th saw oil and gas executives talking to me about at the time. One, what is digital? It's, it's, it's a confusing term. Uh, when will digital innovations come to oil and gas? When they do come, what will be the impact? Will it be catastrophic? Will it be beneficial? Will it be positive, negative? Uh, what kinds of digital te tools and technologies are going to be the most impactful? In other words, which ones should, should we pay most attention to? Will there be winners and will there be losers? And for individuals who are deeply concerned about the future, um, you know, considering the downturn in, in Calgary and, and oil and gas in particular, what does digital do to people in their careers and their jobs? And so I wanted to address all of that and put it into a, a package that people could easily ingest and absorb and then put to work uh, in their organizations or in their day-to-day -day, uh, lives. That's a that's a huge undertaking, and I can see why it has been so well received. And I did actually have a signed copy from you at one point, but I think it lasted about a half an hour in my hands. Before I, so I'll be asking you for my uh, my signed copy on the ninth as well. Uh, some people think that um, the digital digital transformation is a bit of a threat, Jeffrey. And we we've we talked about that in the past. And um, you know, how are you? What's your what's your concept around that? Well. In terms of jobs and, and economy. Yeah, I mean, most anytime there's a significant change uh, to life, uh, human's first reaction is a defensive one. Uh, we, 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 this is going way back hundreds of thousands of years as, as, as uh, early humans. If you saw something you didn't understand, your immediate thought was it's a threat. And uh, so it's quite easy to regress to that position when change comes to the, uh, to the, to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, history has also taught us that anytime we bring innovative new solutions, technologies to bear, uh, it tends to have um, an expansion effect on the economy and jobs and creativity and so forth. And digital is very similar in, in, in that regard. Companies who have embraced digital innovation, as it turns out, are wi growing wildly. Uh, the, the top five largest companies in the world by market cap are all digital companies. Alphabet, Apple, Tencent, Microsoft, Facebook. 
And uh, so th- these companies are creating enormous wealth and, and uh, lots of job potential. It stands to reason that similar opportunities will come to those organizations in oil and gas who also embrace digital innovation. So this event that we're hosting on September the 9th in Calgary, and, and just by the way, we will be hosting events in other cities coming up, and that information will be available at a later date. But focusing on September the 9th here in Calgary, and we have a full day of activities and, and learning, maybe, you know, can we talk a little bit about the intended audience? Who are we looking to draw in uh, to participate? We've got about 50 seats uh, available, and uh, we've had uh, a quick uptake in the last in the last month, lots of conversations, and we've been doing some social media. Uh, but we're having some feedback. You know, who should actually be kind of attending this? What does that person look like? Mm. So the uh, digital is very democratic. It doesn't distinguish between or, or it doesn't favor one part of industry over another. And you can see this virtually every employee in in the oil industry, doesn't matter whether you're in upstream, midstream, downstream or services, you're probably walking around with a supercomputer in your pocket. So the digital innovation is going to come to the industry uh, at at all levels. And uh, so the the uh, the imperative here to get educated as to what actually what is what is digital? What does it mean? And what are the where should um, uh, where and how will will our industries change? Uh, really doesn't distinguish between companies or sectors. The course is aimed principally, though, at those in uh, leadership, management, supervisory, and professional roles who are being asked to either bring digital innovation into their company, are dealing with the digital innovation in an adjacent department uh, that may have an effect on their business, or being asked to turn on uh, digital investments or judge digital investments. Those individuals will benefit greatly from from a course like this. This is, You're not going to take this course and come out a coder. What you will do is you will come out of this course much more literate on what uh, artificial intelligence is and where does it play in this industry? What about blockchain? How about robotics? What's the importance of data? How to think about cyber? Uh, these are the topics we're going to cover off in this course. So... So that's a that's a really great answer, and I and I love that because I think uh, Lisa shifting gears and and talking with you as a you know very well known uh, educator here in the Calgary market. Your background as a subject matter expert in the areas of uh, land regulatory ethics, sustainability. You have a very deep application. Um, uh, background experience and you are focused on working in the applied research and innovation services or ARIS area. So you are so close to all of the kind of clean tech, un- unconventional, interesting new stuff that's coming. What is happening in the post-secondary schools? And I'm not just talking about SAIT, but in your knowledge sort of here across Canada, particularly in the energy sector, what are we seeing that's available today to be able to tool up this, this community that's, you know, focused on, you know, learning and getting their degrees today, or even the post-secondary opportunities for adult learners, what's available to kind of get their hands on this information today? That's a great question. Um, I think it depends on, on the area of, um, for example, energy, we are mandated to, to prepare our students for the workforce and, you know, we've got a lot of companies that in the past were very innovative in their own way. And, and recently they just don't have the money. It's, you know, sink or swim. Um, so we're not getting um, as much of a, of a push to get students ready right now for the innovative side. Um, so there isn't a ton of it. However, there are, for example, ARIS, there's programs like that where we have, um, we've got technologies, we've got companies, innovative companies coming to us and we involve our students in that. So they're, mm-hmm. they're involved in the research, they're applying their learning in real time. Um, with, and that's amazing. But in terms of just, you know, say AI, let's learn what that is and get out and be workforce ready. I don't think there's a lot of that going on at this so you, point. So you think there's actually a gap in the market today around digital and energy? What's your... Yeah, um, absolutely. And yeah. I do see that That I think that um, that you do need to have nimble companies who can offer um, courses in bite-sized chunks. And um, and I think that's going to help get get people ready for the workforce. 
What do you think the industry is doing to actually address the gap? Are they are they going out on their own and doing things, or is there is there sort of a wait and see attitude? I can't speak for industry um, in its entirety, but from what I've seen, it, it there's no they're not really getting together and working together um, to address challenges like this, which I think is what's needed. Um, everyone's kind of doing it in their own little pockets. And, um, and so I do think they're going, they're outsourcing. They're yeah. going to companies yeah. like IQ management and, yeah. and taking these kind of two day courses, which is great. Why don't we shift gears a little bit, um, Jeffrey, and let's talk a little bit about what's happening in the boardroom. Um, I know that energy investors, you know, they're looking right now keenly. There's a lot of things happening in the stock markets. Uh, investment dollars have been leaving Canada. There's been a lot of notoriety around, you know, investments and uh, people that are actually focused on making net new investments or focusing on getting their businesses ready for, you know, digital or they're talking about cyber or innovation. Mm -hmm. What are the drivers for these investors? What are they... What are they caring about in the boardroom? Well, they are one of their biggest concerns by uh, for, uh, uh, is that there is a unanticipated, highly disruptive business model that's being incubated somewhere, anywhere in the world, and they don't know about it. And it, it'll pop up out of nowhere uh, because of the effect of, of Moore's Law, uh, where uh, the, these companies experience uh, exponential growth. And suddenly that business model sideswipes what was a very uh, a strong, stable, and powerful business. It's happened over and over and over again. Um, Toys R Us, uh, Blockbuster yep. Video, the taxi industry, um, and people who say, well, that can't happen in oil and gas because uh, we're a hard asset business. Uh, I think they should think again. Uh, there, yep. uh, as one example, uh, there's a, a category of applications, apps for uh, smartphones that allow you to have fuel delivered to your car. And um, if an app like that takes off um, so that fuel goes to people's car rather than people taking their cars to go get fuel, uh, the industry will have stranded a class of assets called convenience stores. And in Canada, there's 17,000 of these things. So uh, no boardroom wants to be at the switch when a innovator pops up and destroys the value of a, of a huge asset class just like that. And that's happening today. That's not a fantasy. Those apps already exist. They're in other parts of the world. That's a great, uh, that's actually a great scenario or a great example. Um, let's talk a little bit about the actual day itself. We have a, a day long set aside. We've got 50 people in the room. Jeffrey, what is the outcome of this day long session? You're focused on energy issues. You're focused on digital transformation. Yeah. What is your, your goal? You're getting up there. You're not just a talking head. What's actually going to be happening? So the, the course has uh, a series of, of outcomes in mind. Um, when people leave the class, uh, what I want them to be is reasonably digitally literate. Uh, they will know and, and be able to express um, what digital is and be able to uh, share examples and insights from the class about what the other digital innovations are, 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 are out there. Um, the, they will also be exposed to the top 10 uh, technologies that comprise digital and how these technologies are being used in the oil and gas industry today. And those technologies include things like uh, the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence, machine learning, gamification, and so forth. Uh, third, they will come out of the class with a, a much deeper understanding at a value segment level, upstream, midstream, downstream, capital projects, uh, support services, turnarounds, uh, where, uh, what does the future look like for these segments of the value chain as these digital innovations uh, come into the sector and create these new business models? What are they likely to look like? And uh, finally, and a big chunk of the book actually is devoted to this question, some 40% of the content actually, um, how should they be thinking about the management of change and implementation issues associated with adopting uh, digital innovation? How do you organize for this? How do you address uh, uh, cyber issues? How do you deal with um, the talent uh, problem? How do you how do you how do you think about the talent questions that digital is going to raise? And what what methods should you follow to develop your strategy? So those are the outcomes of the class. G getting people, I call it kind of shovel ready for a digital project. You get you got the basics. 
and um, and and from there they can um, in their back in their own organizations uh, join a, a digital team or work on a digital project and be much better equipped to um, be able to converse knowledgeably on the topic area. This um, concept, I guess, of being a tried and true energy sector where not a lot of change happens quickly. I mean, I think that's a fairly fair statement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you kind of look historically, there are not a lot of first movers and shakers, you know, rushing to to new technology. What do you what's your consideration around, you know, you're imparting this level of knowledge? Are we going to be see people talking peer to peer, company to company, um, you know, throughout the supply chain? Is it going to be just about careers, people doing projects? What are we actually talking about? And is it senior people, more intermediate, middle of the road people, or is it the young up and coming energy professional who are really going to care about these topics? Well, um, certainly what I'm seeing is that the young upcoming um, professionals are very interested in this because they are already digitally switched on. Many, many um, of our younger uh, professionals in energy are um, uh, grew up with smartphones and smart technologies uh, from, from uh, school. So very switched on, very aware um, the, unfortunately, though, the industry is not uh, very appealing to that segment of the population. There's numerous studies now that point to uh, reluctance by the next generation uh, to work in, in, in oil and gas and energy in particular uh, because of concerns about the, um, the, the, the uh, uh, slow adoption of digital innovation and will my career be stranded in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in this area, you know, a, a part of the economy that is now uh, on the way out. Um, where, you know, but if you look around, we're, we're going to be with fossil fuels for a very long time. We don't have replacements for plastics and many fuels, uh, paint, uh, carpeting, clothing, all kinds of things are, 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 going to, are very reliant on, on this technology, um, fossil fuels. So we're going to, we're going to have fossil fuels for a long time. In the class, my expectation is that, um, the, the, Principal beneficiaries uh, will be uh, those individuals who are middle or later on in their careers, uh, who are still have quite a considerable runway in front of them, uh, measured in years, not not um, not months, but years, <laughs> so that as this in, these innovations come into the industry, they can play a meaningful role in helping their organizations adopt uh, these changes and help invent a, a, a better and um, you know, cleaner future for for all of us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lisa, you're really, again, such an active member of the energy community and very well respected. And as a leader at Eris, um, you know, you're very politically motivated, you know, for the good of the energy sector and not just again in oil and gas, but all of that clean tech. Can you talk a little bit about your experience, uh, you know, and specifically point to some of the early adopters or the movers and shakers in the new tech here in Alberta? Who are they? What are they doing? Um, I think, well, we lost uh, Stout Oil, um, who is now Equinor, but they were definitely, and, and still remain that way, they're early adopters. Um, we've got Spartan Controls, um, who have been very generous donors to SAIT in the past, and, and they're always leading the way. Um, they've got uh, actually a really neat new technology that... Um, that PTAC worked with them on, and um, apparently they can... They've been able, there's about 400 units now that have been put in place, um, which is translated to about 900,000 tons of GHG emission um, removed and about 15 million in operating costs. Um, so I think they definitely deserve some recognition. Um, but I think a lot of the, the companies are starting, um, I think, since 2014, you know, it, technology and innovation is driven by need. And I think though we've been slow in the past, there, it's starting to move. And um, I think, you know, there's ARIS, Alberta Innovates, COSIA, PTAC. Um, they're all into information sharing. And, and we're getting better at it. We really are. Um, and, and it's nice to see. And it is creating some new jobs. And as Jeffrey mentioned, uh, we definitely do have the challenge of getting younger people involved in the industry. Mm -hmm. um, they basically, you know, they see us as evil but there are others who do recognize, as Jeffrey said, that fossil fuels are going to be around for a long time and they've got more in, in their mentality is more, OK, you know, what, what are we going to do to help? What are we going to do to make a difference if we're going to be using um, fossil fuels? Let's clean it up. Uh, and so you do have the young people coming into the industry in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, not in the traditional jobs, though. 
And and so industry itself is sort of evolving. It's almost morphing. I mean, it's the innovation within the industry itself, and then the layer of digital uh, transformation. Really, it's it's really kind of coming together from my perspective. So it's not just about one thing or another. It's actually all of these communities of interest working together. It sounds like. Absolutely, I think there's been a real spirit of collaboration that's come out. Um, it's actually been amazing to see. And, uh, and I don't think in the past we needed to do that. Everybody was just head down, let's work. You know, right. that drill, drill, baby, drill. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, the minute that all the jobs started disappearing, people thought, uh-oh, you know, I'm, I'm committed to Alberta. My family's here. You know, I love, I love where I live, and, and I've got to make a go of this. And, um, and we're proud of our industry. So I think it'd be great. Um, one of the things we hear a lot about is made in Alberta solutions. Mm-hmm. And we really do want to show um, the rest of Canada, if not the world, um, we're best in class. And, you know, <laughs> try as you might, we're not going away. Right. Jeffrey, from your perspective, who do you feel are the first movers and shakers in the industry, maybe the early adopters in the, in the industry in all segments of what we classify as the energy industry? And who are the actual innovators that are actually creating some new technology? Well, almost all cities in around the world with a uh, an orientation or an emphasis on, on energy products and services have established a network of uh, incubation hubs, accelerators, uh, where uh, startups can thrive, and Calgary is no different. There's uh, a handful of uh, fantastic place uh, places and facilities locally here. Uh, uh, the um, uh, the kinds of companies that have come out of these uh, facilities include Stream Systems, who are uh, very very cl- have very clever uh, technologies for uh, developing digital versions of complex network assets. Uh, Osprey Informatics, who have a visualization technology for uh, uh, using visual um, uh, machine learning to interpret a visual signal, a data that's uh, that you know we call coming off of a camera, but uh, they interpret the, that camera to do things like recognition of objects, people, things, and so forth. Um, companies like uh, Virum, who specialize in uh, robotics and uh, automation, or BrainToy, which is a startup up at the university that is democratizing the front end of using artificial intelligence tools. Or White Whale, another uh, interesting startup that has uh, very clever solutions for uh, uh, working with uh, with data. The companies that are buying these technologies um, are uh, starts with some of the larger organizations in in the oil and gas industry because they have they have the the uh, financial wherewithal to uh, invest. Um, but the, the part of the organization, the industry that is not as switched on, not as um, aggressive, not as advanced and thinking about this is, is in the middle, the middle of the market. That's the part of the market that I think is at risk of not getting, um, taking full advantage of what these tools can actually do. They'll just get bought up by bigger companies because they'll be so far behind. Well, that's the risk. You know, the, uh, the problem with, um, just to use an example uh, for a golfer, any, any golfer worth their, worth their salt, if you said to them, can you visualize if you if you had to strike your golf ball and get it 30 yards out could could you could you point to broadly where you think 30 yards are and most humans linearly we we, we can figure that out 30 exponential yards however where you're exponentially devol- developing your capabilities is 26 times around the earth so mm-hmm. in the same time that someone who is linearly adapting their process patiently and slowly step at a time might progress 30 yards uh, but the the, te- the innovators that are following digital methods will have sh- shot way beyond where your where your companies or your your company might be at. So digital is not really a shiny new penny. Or, Absolutely it's, not. It's, it's been it's a major shift. It's a major shift, and and these these tools have been incu- uh, incubating and bubbling along for a very long time. Most of us, you know, you don't mind to think about this, but Excel dates back to the eighties. Mm-hmm. And yet it is the backbone tool for much of what we uh, we do in, in um, analytics in, in most offices. It's not to say that Excel is a poor tool. It's not. It's a very good tool. And it's kept pace with the times. But uh, at the same time, it is a 40-year-old concept. Um, and the volume of data that we're, that's now uh, flooding over the transom is we add more sensors to things and, and more, more um, uh, sophisticated telecommunications networks. Uh, we need heavy duty tools, better tools to be able to do the analysis that we need done. And that's the role of artificial intelligence and machine learning. Let's talk a little bit about a, a sensitive topic, uh, really for anybody in any industry as a person, as a company, as a government, a municipality. 
Um, hacking really has been making the news quite significantly. And I, I wanted to sort of throw that in there as a topic of, of conversation. What does that mean relative to this particular event on September 9th to the energy sector? And what are the global agencies saying about it with respect to digital? What, what are the risks here in, in the world of hacking? Well, the U- U.S. Department of Homeland Security which was established after 9-11, keeps track of the various threats uh, to the U.S. uh, economy. And one of the threats they watch carefully is cyber activity. And their surveys are telling them that for the last four years, 50 percent or more of all attacks um, that that, uh, you would characterize as cyber attacks have been aimed at the energy industry. So this is a this is a board level topic, a board level concern. Uh, you would have thought that it would be, you know, banking institutions, but it isn't. It, it's it's uh, uh, because if you're a state actor, and a lot of these problems in, in cyber world come from state actors, you're, you're trying to destabilize whole economies and, and take entire um, economies off offline. And the way to do that is to target the finan- the um, uh, energy infrastructure. And so, cyber is a big deal. It's a big issue. It's one of those red lines you just don't cross. Uh, so in the course, what we do is we talk through what are the principal ways that uh, cyber activity um, is uh, targeting uh, uh, the energy industry. What are the digital innovations that our companies are using to uh, create defenses against uh, the uh, cyber activity? For instance, um, the cyber criminals are using bots and artificial intelligence to automate their attacks. And so the le- leading companies in the industry are fighting back by using bots and AI to uh, detect and monitor those attacks and, and use uh, digital tools to repel those attacks. And so that's the kind of thing that we touch on in this, in this course, to give people insight as to how these tools can be, uh, can be used, even, even in the world of cyber. And it sounds to me like a procurement people need to be lining up to do this knowledge you know, transfer as well, because how, how are people even that are sort of, you know, buying, you know, tech or deploying tech and managing tech? It's not just the IT guys anymore. It's not just the IT guys anymore. No, that's good. That's quite right. I mean, not only should procurement itself um, be embracing digital innovation to make procurement more efficient and and uh, uh, and adaptable, uh, but procurement professionals do run the risk of of blocking unnecess- uh, unnecessarily or or uh, for for good, best of intentions, but wrong answer, uh, block innovation from coming in because that innovation. Um, is either perceived to be too risky or not proven enough or, or lacks the kind of, you know, robustness that they would expect to see. Some, some uh, digital innovations um, are going to have first run customers. And if procurement is, is, is saying, no, 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 you have to show me your list of 30 prior installations. Uh, that's a quick recipe for making sure no innovation ever comes in. Correct. And I think that actually does happen in the uh, energy sector. Yeah. Probably, and, you know, the probably, oil and gas executives don't want to be the first to trial things that go could go bang in the night. Right. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's a it's a rational human response. But sometimes the, the, the rationality of saying no to something that that um, that, you know, you know, in the, in the years past m- might cause an explosion or asphyxiation or something. Those same rules uh, may be overly rigidly applied to digital, which doesn't feature um, in, in creating those kinds of risks. So philosophically, you are actually going to be addressing next steps. How do you actually get your arms around projects? How do you identify opportunities? Yes. Yep. That's exactly right. Where do you start? I, like, I, this is all about um, getting going um, because the, the way digital, digital is moving so quickly, it almost doesn't matter where you start. Yeah. Because by the time you get even get going, digital will have moved on. So the, the secret here is get started, uh, not, yeah. not study it forever. Just get started. So I'm really excited about the fact that we're announcing that everybody's getting a copy of your book, Jeffrey. It's a best-selling book. Tell mm. us about this. You have a, a co-author. Uh, Rachel Goyden. Uh, yep. So Rachel. Rachel and mm-hmm. she's, she's uh, you know, you guys have done a great job and it's, it's just really, it's almost like a playbook for people. And, you know, we're actually going to be giving everybody a copy that comes signed copy. And tell us a little bit about the structure of the day and how you're actually going to be using that as a tool. So the, uh, the uh, in the course of the um, uh, conversations uh, during the day, we, we will actually be able to point indivi- people to specific pages of the book uh, where certain questions will crop up. So, for instance, if you said to me, um, talk to me about jobs of the future. Like, what does that mean? Like, what is the future for talent? I'd say turn to page 182. And at the at the the paragraph there, we'll sketch out some of the job roles that you're likely to find uh, in oil and gas in the future. So the book becomes an integral part 
of helping uh, the um, participants in the class uh, take on board, absorb, and, and then put to work the, uh, uh, the, the insights that the book contains. And it's backed up with a glossary of terms because, you know, what you can leave the class and go, I can't remember what blockchain is. Oh, well, turn to the uh, uh, glossary of terms because it'll give you a quick definition and um, the index will point you to a handful of uh, passages in the, in the book that will sketch out how, what blockchain is and how it actually works in oil and gas. That's fantastic. Lisa, last word on um, from your perspective. What do you think the work cho- the workforce how do you think the workforce will be impacted by this knowledge? You are clearly a, a professional educator. You've got deep industry knowledge for the last 15 years. What's going to happen to the industry once this no- uh, knowledge gets out on a larger scale? Um, I think that one thing that at least I'd, I'd like to see is that the senior staff uh, lets go of their fear, um, the barriers they have towards succeeding in this area because they've got immense knowledge. They've got all the history of, of the industry, um, which we need. Um, I think they need to couple that, though, with giving young people a, a, a place at the table rather than than the typical you know, junior, intermediate, senior put in your time. Um, I think that people really need to rec- recognize that young people adopt uh, and adapt a lot quicker. And combined, um, I think there's their strength um, together. So I do see that happening. I think that the people who are older will have a tougher time, um, but the young people can come in and they can bridge that and they can jumpstart it. Mm -hmm. And so there's there's really that that need for collaboration and to put aside the arrogance um, that typically comes with with having been in an industry um, and, and held maybe a managerial role in the past. Um, and, and we've all done it. We've all, we've all been guilty of it, um, but we need to let that go. Um, and, you know, it, and just, and work together. I, I think that you're probably right. You've hit the nail on the head. The younger work for sort of 35 and under, they're more agile, they're more motivated. They've grown up, as you said, Jeffrey, with this technology. It's sort of the, you know, Facebook, Twitter, you know, cell phones, iPad, ga- you know, gamification of so many, so many things. Mm-hmm. And so all, all of a sudden we're talking about a, a new environment where, you know, the rules of the road are changing. It's not just the four walls in your office. There's an awful lot of collaboration that has to cross so across it's not just across the hallway it's across generations um the knowledge the people that that hold so much of the knowledge in the industry the as we call the older worker and i dare i say over 40, <laughs> 45 that's everybody sitting around the table here um great gold you know, yeah this is you know, a really op- great opportunity for us to to work together what are some of the jobs and both of you feel free to jump in what are we going to be seeing in the future we've we've you know taken a cut at getting this knowledge out we're going to be continuing to educate in the market focusing on getting this knowledge out and jeffrey as an advisor uh steeped in in the market will be getting his hands dirty with certain customers but what's what do we see as the future job market here what are people going to be seeing online well, I can share a little bit about bots and and um, uh, as just one example. So bot technology originated in the gaming industry 15 years ago. It's not new. It's, it's just, uh, but it was banned in many games because it was so efficient. It made people, un, um, it gave them superhuman capabilities. And uh, so the te- te- uh, bot technology, think about that. A technology that 15 years ago gave you superhuman capabilities to do things was banned uh, because it gave you an unfair advantage. And it's now coming to industry. The, so how bots work is uh, they, they, a bot will, say, um, take um, data from point A to point B. Well, the data may have originated in this department and then gets used in that department. And what the bot does is it automates that process. But for that to work, the bot has to have the uh, privileges of the two employees that may have been doing the data movement in the past. And so now you have a, a bot, a technology, whose um, way it operates is above the normal uh, um, pattern, norms, performance measures associated with uh, the, the, the original job. It's like a super job. Well, that's going to require special uh, individuals to step up and uh, it's going to need bot handlers, bot wranglers, we call them, individuals who can keep bots working and, and as the world changes around them. There's a whole job category there just waiting to be filled. China is the world's largest buyer of industrial robots, and they report that they are short a million and a half uh, robot operators today. 
And if and so if we bring bot technology into our industries here, and the certain uh, evidence looks like we will, we're going to have uh, uh, a crying need for bot specialists. And I would throw into that, you know, data people and and other uh, other capabilities as well. Mm-hmm. Deployment specialists, oh, yeah. even change, user experience, even, even think about change user. management people need to know what they're getting involved in. Uh, precisely, yeah. So the yeah, change management, uh, user experience, like you know, how many of us have gone to the quote Uber training class to learn how to use the Uber app? Well, guess yeah. what? They don't have an Uber training class. The app is so simple to use; you don't need training. Yeah. Well, when was the last time we had an oil and gas system where people didn't need training on it? You just sort of rolled it out and they used it. The, the, the digital world is thought quite differently about how to create things that make them so compelling, so easy to use, seductive and addictive. People want to use them. And imagine that in oil and gas. Well, that's a whole job to think about user experience and how do you create yeah. things so seductive your employees are desperate to use them. Yeah, they want to be involved in it. Yeah. This is this is a very exciting time that we're living right now. I kind of look at it back as like 1995 again, because uh, there's a whole new, uh, you know, frontier of technology that nobody's ever seen or touched before. And it's going to be changing and evolving um, as time goes on. All I know is we're, we're going to be focused on getting everybody ready. We're launching September 9th here in Calgary. We're going to be traveling across the country. Calgary is where we're all from, and we're very focused on getting everybody ready. This is the basics. This is now, Energy Now is our media partner. If you follow the links on the Energy Now website or go to jeffreycan.com, you will find all of your registration information. Or if you need to reach out to me personally, you can contact me at michelle at digitalgirl.ca. I thank you very much today for putting the time in to review this incredible content. And we're very excited about launching this in Calgary. Thank you so much, Lisa, for joining us. And Jeffrey, we'll see you, uh, I guess we'll see you both actually on on the day of the event in Calgary. Uh, Lisa, you'll be there joining us as well. So uh, hopefully we get uh, to meet lots of folks from Calgary and we're going to be at the Hyatt Hotel at nine o'clock. So register online and thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at JeffreyCan, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil & Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil & Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.